so we are like okay good evening uh, we have the 10th lecture of i focus today it's professor uma kulkarni again uh, last time uh, in this series of lectures she'll be speaking on applied optics of uh, keratometer slit lamp and goniscope today so welcome and enjoy your talk uma thank you yeah i'll start okay so here we start can i say so today's uh, sessions on keratometry slit lamp biomicroscopy and a bit on uh, the gonio lenses so what is this keratometry we all know we all use it day in and day out for bi for uh, biometry when we we need to know the curvatures of the cornea and this was also called as ophthalmometry which and initially it was thought that or uh, there's some connection between the whole of the eye and these reflexes and so it was called ophthalmometry because we are measuring something there belonging to the eye but uh, then we came to know that it's only the curvature of the cornea which is measured and therefore this is called as keratometry so if uh, i hear that there are some students who are uh, on the panel today so i would like to hear some answers from you so keratometry measures the curvature of which portion of the cornea is it central 1 mm zone or central 3 mm zone or 5 mm zone or the central 7 mm zone can i have some of the students there to answer huh? central 3 mm zone excellent so that's only central that's why we want to emphasize that keratometry does not measure the curvatures of the whole of the cornea it's only concerned with the central 3 mm zone and that's because that's the part which is very crucial in focusing the rays of light on the fovea and that's why only central 3 mm however there are some other keratometers the automated keratometers which measure the curvatures of the cornea even to the extent of the whole of the cornea and not just limited to 3 mm again one more question keratometry measures which corneal curvatures is it the anterior curvature posterior curvature is it the average of the anterior and posterior or average or central and peripheral anterior yes it is the anterior surface of the cornea the curvature of which is the most crucial one for bending of the rays so we know that the total power of the eye is around 60 diopters of which almost 40 to 45 diopters is contributed by the anterior surface of the cornea and that's why we are more worried about more concerned on more wanting to measure the anterior cur uh, curvature of the cornea rather than posterior and as we said that the automated um, keratometers which are available they do measure the curvatures of the posterior also they give the anterior float the posterior float and we get all the measurements in these including the peripheral curvatures of the cornea so we need to know this so let's see how a uh, optical keratometer measures the curvature of the cornea so we know that cornea can be a uh, normal curve curvatures cornea can be slightly flat or it can be more curved so any surface like this the, uh, the curvature determines the size of the image formed on it so it this acts like a convex mirror so our corneas act like a convex mirror and the curvature determines the size of the object uh, size of the image so if when we look at a bright source of light we see the purkinje image is there right so the first purkinje image which is formed by the anterior surface of the cornea is the one we are talking about right now so this image the size of which is determined by the curvature of the cornea we see that uh, if an object is kept here say i have put up this a here you will see that the ray of light that passes goes through the f that is the focal point of the lens of the uh, this, this curvature so there, there are two notations here one is c and one is f c is double this distance so if this is 1 mm this is going to be 2 okay and all the parallel rays of light 
being this this being a convex mirror get reflected back when they get reflected back and it is traced back it meets this point f that's the first ray the second ray passes directly through c so the image that is formed is formed where these two rays meet that is here so we see that an erect minified image is formed within the anterior chamber of the cornea this is uh, so th this is the object this is the first purkinje image which is formed in the anterior uh, chamber of the eye so now if we see that this is a flatter cornea in a and this is the more globular cornea so see given that the object is the same size and at the same distance from the eye the ray of light now passes and passes through f and the image form is much smaller when the curvature is more or at the same time when the curvature is flat the image form is larger so what is determining the size of the image it's not the size of the object or the distance it is the curvature of the cornea where everything else is constant the curvature is determining the size of the image so what does this tell us that if we know the size of the object we know the size of the image we can de deduce or we can calculate the curvature of the cornea and that is what we want so this is the basis for keratometry the basis for keratometry is that if we know the object size and we know the image size which needs to be calculated mathematically we can calculate the rate curvature of the cornea so this is very simple and this forms the basis for keratometry now this is the image that we were talking about so when we shine a torch light into the patient's eye whether it is for cover test or whether it is for just when you are an artist and you draw an eye and then you put a white dot on the surface of the eye that's nothing but the purkinje sense of first purkinje sense and image which we are talking about but measuring the size of this we know the size of this object but measuring the size of this is pretty difficult you know why because our eyes are not very steady the eyes are moving all the time there's some kind of a movement which is always there and therefore catching hold of this image measuring its size in a moving eye and a moving image is very very difficult and that's the principle for keratometry the principle for keratometry is measuring the size by using something called the principle of doubling of images so let's see this now this is the object we are talking about by using two glass prisms okay this glass prism and this is another glass prism the rays of light pass through it and an image is formed by each of these glass prisms okay so there are two images which are formed here now that the glass prisms are very close to each other the images are also are very close to each other by separating the two glass prisms uh, uh, yes as the movement of the object is happening the image also is moving and the double images are also moving so again it is still difficult to measure the size of the image but we have to find a trick for that the trick is that if we separate these two images so that they are equi they are just touching each other that means the amount of excursion required to do this will determine the size of the object so so simple it is so by the principle of doubling of images is to overcome the micro movement of the images and the amount of rotation required to move the images to get them side by side this gives the size of the image when we get the size of the image mathematically you can calculate the curvature of the cornea this is the basic so if you are asked in the examination what is the principle there are two things we need to speak about the first one is how an image is formed considering the surface of the cornea is a convex mirror how an ima a minified image is formed and where it is formed that's the first thing you need to tell and the second thing is to measure this size we need something called a principle of doubling of images using this glass prisms so if you write this i think you will get 50% of the marks the next 50% of the marks will come after description of this there are two types of keratometry basically one where the size of the object is fixed that is the mire is fixed but the doubling is changed so by moving the doubling of the images 
we can determine the size of the image next is by amount of doubling is changed fixed whereas the size of the object is varied so typically we use the boshan norm or yavel shear stonometer uh, not uh, keratometry we have the boshan norm and we are using this i am not sure about you but this is a widely used uh, keratometry so these are the examples now we'll see how a boshan norm uh, keratometer works boshan norm as we said the size of the object is fixed whereas the amount of doubling is varied this is the typical uh, instrument that we see in our opds if you break it open and remove all those black uh, coverings of it you will see something like this so we'll see how the illumination system is here okay so i'll just orient you to this diagram this these are the different knobs that you move this is the focusing beam this is the drum uh, this is the rotating knob which is for the vertical on on the other side is the horizontal uh, rotating knob and this is the patient side this is a chin rest this is r i and this is mind you it's a uniocular procedure we are not seeing with both the eyes but we are seeing only with one eye unlike more un, unlike most other equipment the operating microscope the slit lamp they are all binocular here it is a uniocular equipment so we are on this side the patient is on this side so let's see how the illumination system works this is the bulb over here this is an illumination that goes and can you see this oval mirror here this is the one which helps in reflecting all the light that comes from here on to this mirror okay this is a reflecting mirror which is just allowing the change of direction from this side towards the patient's eye so this mirror is helping us to bring the light, uh, rays of light parallel rays of light to fall on this condensing lens so this condensing lens as you see focuses these parallel rays of light at its focal point and at this focal point is the patient's eye going to come between the condensing lens and the patient's eye we need something more and what do we require an object an object whose image can be formed on the cornea by the cornea of the uh, patient's eye and that is here these are called myers so the myers are nothing but the objects whose image is formed on the cornea of the patient and this image acts in a, like an object for us to see and measure the radius of curvature of the cornea so here is the patient side so this is the illumination system so what does the illumination system consist of it consists of a bulb and a reflector here a mirror to uh, to reorient the rays of light towards the condensing lens the myers and the placement of the patient's eye at appropriate position so we make sure that the patient's head is rested on the um, the forehead rest the chin rest everything adjusted so that it is central so this is illumination now coming to the observation system yes that's how the light travels into the eye coming to the observation system now we are on this side right now the illuminated eye with the image of the myers is here the image is already formed the rays of light again pass through this condensing lens travels through that partially reflecting mirror pass through a series of lenses because they are required to direct them into the doubling prisms here the prisms are over here and the doubling prisms we know the reason why we are using the doubling prisms because they need to split this um, uh, image of the myer into two and only when we change the distance between the two and align them side by side we are getting the readings of the radius of curvature so and here is our eye the rays of light from each doubling prism the image of this passes into our eye and we see two images over here this is the observation system so what does the observation system contain it consists of that same condensing lens and another objective here doubling prisms is a most important part of the component of the observation system and they pass through the eyepiece and again eyepiece consists of a telescopic system a two lens system uh, which helps in magnifying the image because we don't want to see that small image as small we want to see it as large so that fusing of these images or aligning these images becomes easy so this is our system these are the knobs one on this side which is uh, responsible for vertical 
and the other other side is the horizontal norm so the mire looks something like this the mire is that uh, through which the light passes through so this is a gap over here through which the light passes through this forms a shadow which we see on the patient's eye okay these are circular typically in bosch and long these are circular with a plus sign and a minus sign these are very important to locate because these are the ones which we are going to fuse and not the circles themselves so light, light passes through these mires and forms an image on the cornea that means the cornea forms the image inside the eye so this eye i have chosen uh, heterochromic eye and this is the image that is formed on the eye but when we, the uh, rays of light come out of this one single image they pass through something the objective lens which we call it and they pass through the bi prisms and they get split that image gets split into two images so what we are seeing suppose we see the same eye from outside not through the keratometer we see only one image on the cornea but when we see through the keratometer we see the double image so this is by the horizontal horizontally placed uh, prisms which split the image into two similarly there are there is another system of doubling prism which splits the image into two so in all there are four images formed one by the vertical separation of doubling prisms and second by the horizontal splitting of doubling prisms why do we require double sets of prisms we require them because we want to measure the curvature in at least two meridia at least the principal two meridia we want to measure so one horizontal separation helps for one meridian and a vertical separation helps in the other meridian let's see how so if we uh, look at it in a magnified view through the uh, eyepiece of the keratometer we see the four images like this okay we can make out one and two Three and four. Now, out of these, these two images are split by the horizontal uh, uh, doubling prisms, and these two are by the vertical doubling prisms. Okay, so we need to now focus them and bring them closer together. Let's see how. So, first thing is to align them like this. That is, you fuse first the central myers and focus them. so there's a focusing mechanism by which you bring them closer now the four circles have become three because the central ones are now fused once this has happened you know you, we also have to align them in the center of the pupillary area that's very very important to have them central suppose you even go to the periphery and have them on the periphery the myers won't be circular like this they'll be very distorted you won't see them clearly the next step is rotate the horizontal and the vertical knobs on either side of the uh, keratometer so when you do that you shift them accordingly by moving them front and back till such time that the two myers are placed side by side and the plus signs are exactly overlapping this is very important sometimes when the tears dry up and the patient is looking straight ahead um, you might feel that these uh, the myers are getting distorted just as the patient to blink once refresh the tear films on tear film on the surface of the cornea and by then you will start seeing them clearly you have to make sure that the plus signs of this one this myer and the uh, the horizontal myer are fused together well the next step is move the vertical one when you move the vertical you should see that the minus sign of this and the minus sign of this myer are exactly opposing each other if we don't take care to make sure that these are exactly opposing each other aligned uh, overlapping each other you will not get a correct reading and there if you get a correct reading of 42 instead of 42.5 that can cost a lot when you, especially when you are calculating iol power using this keratometer so when it is done manually it has to be as accurate as possible you could try two or three times and take an average also that's a good thing to do so once this is aligned this is called the end point make sure everything is focused well and then read out the readings from the knob on the horizontal uh, which is given as 42.5 diopters or 43 diopters and you take that value as one value for the horizontal meridian and take one from the vertical meridian which says whatever the reading is 44 or whatever 
and make the note of these readings. Suppose you actually want to know the radius of curvature on the same knob on the opposite side, radius of curvature is given, which you see values like 6.9, 7, sorry, 7.8, 7.9, such values you get. You can make a note of these values also if you need the radius of curvature. So that's the end point in case of Bosch and Long. Uh, sometimes you might get something like this. This is typically seen when the axis is oblique. So what we saw previously was a vertical and a horizontal axis, but here there is some oblique axis. So what do we do now? The complete head of the keratometer needs to be aligned now. So you can't just do with the vertical and horizontal knobs. You need to completely rotate the head of the keratometer so that these become vertically aligned. Once they are vertically aligned, aligned uh, repeat the same process in order to align these central circles as well as the horizontal and the vertical and then read out the reading take the reading of the astigmatic meridian by looking at how much you have rotated the head of the keratometer that will give us the reading so this is how we do a bosch and loam keratometer i'm sure it's a very easy technique uh, it's a little boring technique if you ask me because uh, there's no charm in that there's nothing digital about it you have to do it yourselves and but it's a very useful technique so sometimes you might also get these some pulsating myers distorted myers this is typically seen in keratoconus and uh, the myers can be very very distorted not exactly like this i tried but i had very little time so i had to rush through this uh, slide i have just shown some distortion of the myers and some pulsation which can be seen in uh, keratoconus when the cornea is very thin and the pressure inside the eye is making the myers to move a bit. So the, you can see some pulsations over there. And when you try to rotate the knobs in order to uh, fuse the horizontal, try and fuse the horizontal or vertical uh, circles, you will see that the movement can suddenly become jerky. And that is where you can know that you might have passed through the cone of uh, the tip of the cone. Uh, so it can happen like that. So it's very difficult to get the uh, keratometry readings in keratoconus. But in early keratoconus, you might actually miss it. There can be very mild distortion and you may even miss it on keratometry. When the myers, uh, when the curvatures are more than 52 diopters, as in full-fledged cases of um, keratoconus, you can see that the myers are slightly smaller also. So um, this is what we do. So we can identify astigmatism, we can identify keratoconus using keratometry. A very, very useful is equipment, if you ask me. So that's all we need to do. Coming to the other uh, type of um, keratometer, and that is the javel Shores keratometer. Here, the size of the myers is varied, not the doubling. So doubling is constant. So what we are doing here is changing the myers, the location of the myers. So these are the myers. They are very difficult. And I think if in the exam they ask me, I'm going to find it very difficult to draw this diagram. The Bosch and Lohm is the preferred one for me because circles are easier to draw and the plus and minus are also easy to draw. But this is the myer in case of shovel short stone keratometer. So the two myers are located on an arc like this and you can rotate the arc um, the components so that the two myers can move simultaneously so i have not actually worked with this but i have only read about it so i'll try to give as best image that i have perceived of ke this keratometer as possible so this is another picture this is the older time uh, images which are which were uh, available on the net so i've chosen them to see so this is the system that is there and as you can see, this also has got some prisms and some lenses. And these are the two myers we were talking about. This is the patient's cornea on which this is a, again acting as a corneal uh, convex mirror. Say this is the myer. The rays of light are going here. And uh, they, they get reflected like this so that the image is formed here. So this is the image which is going to be formed from one and this from the other one. So there are two images which are formed side by side inside the cornea, okay? And this now acts as the object for our observation system, okay? So the, this is the one, one refers to the image formation of the myers on the cornea. 
Now two are the Mayas. One is the green one, which is shown here. The other one is a more squarish one, which is seen here. And there's a system to move these uh, on the arch, which we saw just now in the previous scene. This is the objective lens which, through which rays of light are passed into the prism system. So this is the prism system. This is a doubling prism. The doubling prism is now, there are two images formed, right? There are two Mayas and two images formed. Whereas in uh, Keratum, uh, the first, previous one, there was only one image formed. Here, two images are formed. And each one is doubled here. So the, this green one is passing here and doubling as two images. The pink one is again passing through the doubling prism and two images are formed. For the keratometry purpose, we are looking at only these two images, not the peripheral images. These two images need to be aligned. Okay, the, so five is the plane at which these images are formed and these are observed by us after they are passed through the eyepieces. So observer is, observer is sitting here and looking at this, uh, this uh, component of the doubling prisms, doubling of the images through this condensing lens, which magnifies the image. So these are the two images which are considered. So this looks something like that. So the initial point could be something like this, where two things need to be seen, whether this dark line on one image and the dark line on this image are aligned or not. And second thing to see is what is the spacing between the two, okay? So we need to align them so that the two lines, this and this are in the same line and they're not up and down as is seen here. So the, here we can see that they are not aligned. That means they are not aligned with the axis of the uh, uh, cornea. And therefore what we need to do is to move the images on the arch so that they become more aligned. Once you do that, you now see that in the second step, the two are aligned with each other. When this is done, that means you have achieved one component of it. Now that there is no offset. The second is to change the orientation so that you get the final endpoint. That is, these are aligned and the space between the two is also minimized and they are placed like this. And this is the end point. At this point of time, you have to read it from the knob. What is the curvature is given there? So you can get different types of orientations. One where one image is overlapping the other as happens in astigmatism or they are obliquely placed. And even when they are completely aligned, they fail to come back to the normal position. In which case, this indicates the axis of the keratometer. Now you have to rotate it get it back into the perpendicular meridian. Say now this is around 20 degrees. So now you will be testing in 110 degrees and then you will get the uh, readings of the two perpendicular meridia. So that is how it works. Maybe a little difficult than the Bosch and Lomb one. That's, what, that's how I perceive of it. Now there are many automated uh, keratometers and not the manual ones. We are used to the manual ones, the automated keratometers. They include the IOL master, the Pentacam, Opscan, so many others are there. They are all based on the principle of Placido's disc. So we know that the Placido's disc has got alternate dark and white circles, which are projected onto the surface of the cornea and each ring forms an image on the cornea. So I'm sorry. Ma'am, are you there? Did I get disconnected? No, no, ma'am. You're audible. Okay, okay, okay. okay. So, um, so what we need to see is how are these circles or the mirror, the images of the Placido's disc oriented there? So if they are oriented well, they are circular. Yes, that means that... share your screen. Your screen is not visible. Oh, it's again gone, is it? Okay, yes. one minute. I'll do that. I think I got uh, disconnected for a minute. Yes, ma'am, you're audible, but your screen is not shared. Yeah, I'll do that again. Sorry.
this and that goes through. Yes, ma'am. It's visible now. Oh, yeah. So the placidose disc, uh, which consists of the alternate rings, they form an image on the cornea. And this acts as our focus for understanding whether the cornea is spherical or not. If it is not spherical, you will see something like this. They have become oblong and they have got distorted here. And this is the same principle which is used in all these automated keratometers, where which give, uh, which identify steeper areas and flatter areas and give color coding to it. And that's how we identify uh, different conditions like very early keratoconus to uh, regular astigmatism to oblique astigmatism to terians. All these uh, problems with the corneal curvatures can be identified on this. So they are all compact, they are very convenient and they take very little time to get the readings and they measure both anterior as well as posterior surfaces. They also give the thickness in different areas of the cornea and they are helpful for both central and peripheral. So they're very useful where surgery counts, where refractive surgeries are planned and so on and so forth. So we are not going into the details of that. We now push to slit lamp biomicroscopy after keratometry. So slit lamp biomicroscopy, the biggest advantage is that the illumination beam and the viewing beam can be separated from each other. So they are not incorporated into the same head, but they rotate uh, um, around each other, around each other in such a way that if this is the illumination beam, the viewing beam can be from somewhere else. So that when the light is calling in an object here, the illumination is directed here and the focusing also can be directed from here, but they are separated. So that's the biggest advantage because that allows us to see the cornea and the anterior chamber structures from different angles when the light is falling from different, um, uh, different directions. So that is a very big advantage of slit lamp. So it's actually a split lamp where this, there's a splitting of the viewing beam and the illumination beam to get better imaging for the, from the uh, antechamber and the cornea and the iris and the lens up to the uh, anterior vitreous. We are able to see only with this slit lamp. So here also, again, a lot of optics, but very simplified here in the illumination. You will see how the illumination is working here. So we see that there's a bulb here the illumination system. And there, again, like the ophthalmoscope, like the retinoscope, several different forms of the illumination system have been used. And the currently used one is the halogen. So in the last class, somebody asked me, what is the illumination that you get in indirect ophthalmoscopy? So I really could not find it. But for this, I found out it is 2 into 10 raised to 5 to 4 into 10 raised to 5 lux. So I'm not sure how much what this means actually, but I know if I sit on the other side of this slit lamp, I will know how bright it is. So this is the lamp from where the light is calling on to the second part that is called the collimator lens. So this is the collimator lens, which helps in passing the rays of light coming out of it and making it parallel. So collimator lens or the condensing lens, they are basically a pair of lenses which are kept side to side. So this is a system which is shown together here, but it's actually a pair of convex lenses side to side, which help in one magnifying and second, giving them the path that is a parallelism, parallel rays of light to pass through the rest of the system of the slit lamp. So this is the slit. This is why the slit lamp has got its name, but it's not, it, we could call it a misnomer because we always don't work with a slit. We use uh, even oval apertures or roundish apertures for uh, viewing the different systems of the eye, uh, different parts of the eye. The slit can be elongated as much as this, uh, even up to seven or eight millimeter long and up to 0.5 millimeter thin. So as thin as 0.5 millimeter, we could make it. And we could decrease the size of the slit to the required extent, depending on what you would want to see. So something like this, you would want to see for aqueous uh, flare and aqueous cell counting and all that. This would be, we would use for looking at the section of the cornea. Similarly, the, uh, the width also can be changed. The width can be as wide as this, which is useful for a diffuse illumination and this one for a parallel pipe of the cornea. 
the slit can also be changed in its orientation especially for gonioscopy we would like to we might want to keep it as a horizontal slit and look at the lenses on either side so this is the slit system behind this are filters again filters just like our uh, direct ophthalmoscopy or even the uh, indirect that uh, we were talking about or uh, we can use the red filter uh, sorry red free filter which is green and the blue filter again uh, for the anterior segment examination i think blue filter is more useful because we use lot of fluorescent methods of evaluation for tear film tonometry aplanation tonometry so for all these the blue cobalt filter is used so these are placed behind the uh, diaphragm or the behind the slit and uh, uh, the uh, we can choose these in order to find out in order to use whatever filter we want to use or we could use the white diffuse filter okay the next is fourth the this is where this is the lens where uh, the image of this filament is formed this is the uh, lens where, from where the image of this is passing into our eye into the patient's eye sorry so the image of this filament is formed at this lens and very close to it and from there it is directed into the patient side and on the patient side what falls is the uh, vertical slit if we are putting it as a vertical system so this is the this is the slit illumination of the eye so very simple the illumination system consists of this lens the collimator uh, lens uh, the bulb the collimator lens the slits and the diaphragms the filters the projector lens and lastly it falls on the ix so how is the observation system now the observation system now the eye has moved here and we are sitting on uh, this side this is for the right eye and this is for the left eye this is the binocular system and here is the object here is the eye that we want to see so what is very important is that the observation system of the slit lamp is very important optically the optical optics of this is very important because it gives us a very magnified view of the small structures we are able to see even the small foreign bodies on the eye small nerves that are there in the periphery of the cornea we are able to see the cells in the aqueous chamber so so much magnification good illumination it's there at the same time there's lot of stereopsis also and the image is erect it's not inverted image a lot of advantages and uh, very nicely designed equipment i would say slit lamp is it's it's also having a telescopic system so it's referred to as a telescopic microscope or a compound microscope because a lot of these lenses are used there we have a very good depth of focus in slit lamp and with depth of focus we mean that if we are focusing on the anterior surface of the cornea we are not just seeing the anterior surface of the cornea we are seeing a lot of structures a little behind it also and a little in front of it also so the depth of focus indicates that at one, when uh, structures are focused at one particular point few structures behind it and a few structures in front of it are also seen clearly so when we focus on the cornea you may not see the uh, iris clearly but you can see the depth of the cornea clearly so th this instrument gives a good depth of focus which is also important for operating microscopes it also allows a good working distance because the lens and the eye are separated by a comfortable distance the design of the equipment is such that there's a adequate working distance and this is not too close to the eye for example when we are using the 90d or 78d with slit lamp we keep the lens very close to the eye around 5 to 10 mm from the eye which does not allow any working distance so with slit lamp alone the working distance is very good so much so that we could even remove the foreign body on the corneal surface we could trim the sutures of the uh, wounds um, or um, we could even do some manipulations on the eye and aplanation tonometry aversion of the eyelids some minor procedures can be done along with this slit lamp so it allows this space is a very important points with respect to the optics of the eye the depth of focus the working distance and the stereopsis which comes with it stereopsis is mainly because can you see a small angle alpha here this angle is the one which determines 
that whether we get a good stereopsis or not in slit lamp this angle is around 10 to 14 degrees which is very good for viewing the three dimensional um, aspect of objects which are located at around 25 centimeters from the eye and this is offered by slit lamps most modern slit lamps give a very good stereopsic view so this alpha angle offers a separation of the rays that is required for stereopsis so i think if you are asked in an exam you need to write something about this so next thing is the uh, lens which is here which is called the objective lens this objective lens is the one through which the rays of light coming from the object of regard pass through and come out as parallel beam of light this again is the uh, as we already spoke about it in the observation system in the illumination system is a pair of lenses two convex lenses facing each other and the effective power of this lens is around 22 diopters this offers a good magnification at the same time it allows the rays of light to come out as parallel beam of light now this is a very important component of the uh, slit lamp the next important component of the slit lamp is the um, the telescope system which offers magnification additional magnification to it so if you were, when you work on the slit lamp you know you change something to get more magnification right for some you use the 25x for some you use the 40x sometimes you use the 10 or 15x so depending on how much magnified you want to see the object uh, to the structures of the eye you use different magnifications so that is done using this galilean telescope system to alter the magnification now what is this galilean telescope so if you go back to your 7th 8th 9th standard you have learned about it that it's a combination of one convex lens and a concave lens which are placed at a distance equal to the addition of their focal lens so they give a very magnified view of the object so it's important in magnification this galilean system works something like this we will not go into details of this small small things of optics otherwise you'll go to sleep so this is the disc which we have in our slit lamps where if you can see here i have color coded them the green one one is the convex lens and one is the sorry one is the convex lens and one is the concave lens together they act as the galilean system offering some magnification so that could be say 10x now rays of light when they are passing through it they pass through the convex and concave lens and there is a magnification which is happening there now suppose you want to change the magnification to a higher magnification all you need to do is to rotate this knob so that a new system of telescope comes here the galilean telescope comes here so a bigger lens or maybe a higher powered lens and a higher powered concave lens come into picture and you get a different magnification now say it is 25x now if you want 40x rotate it further so that you get a different combination of lenses and this this way the lenses can be the uh, magnification can be changed so this is a classical one which is present in the zeiss which i use and this is called a litman galilean telescope so the litman system and uh, the litman and galilean propose this for the slit lamp which works very well the only disadvantages of this is that it's not a smooth magnification like we get in operating microscope but it's a step one so we move from 10x to 25x to 40x because it's basically a viewing system and not not an operating system this is good enough so there are uh, operating microscopes with a zoom system also where there's a continuous magnification change as we get in the operating microscope so this is a little difficult to pronounce but this is a system which was present in the hack street uh, kind of uh, uh, operating uh, sorry um, bio a slit lamp bio microscopes where there's something called a turret there's a continuous like what you get in uh, um the warships and all that the, uh, what is there around the tire not tires what do you call it wheels so that's called a turret on which the lenses are placed and they change and give rise to magnification the total of 6 to 40x magnification can be uh, obtained in the slit lamp bio microscope so which is very good 40x is really very good and 6x is required when we want to get a, a bigger a view of the eye in toto so we want to see multiple structures together so 6x is good enough so this is the uh, system this is called the uh, system of prisms which is called the poro abbe prisms 
these prisms help in in reinverting the image because in slit lamp we don't want an inverted image we want an erect image and that's why these prisms help us in getting the images to be re in re uh, inverted so that we get a erect image they are called poro abbe prisms again all exam going students try to remember this this is a composite comp combination of prisms which allows the ray of light to pass from one direction and without deviation it comes out at a different orientation so basically the orientation is changed direction is not changed so that the images are now available for both the eyes separately and by changing the ipd you could move the distance between these two and get it to align to the center of the objective lenses so this is very important in, so that you get a good stereoptic uh, stereoptic view so this is the eyepiece now if this is a galilean system of uh, uh, lenses giving rise to giving us the magnification that we require consisting of a convex and a concave lens this is called astronomical telescope here there are two convex lenses so we need to remember this if you are writing in diagrams that this is a combination of a convex and a concave lens whereas this is a combination of two convex lenses surprisingly these combinations both of them give rise to magnification only this is called the astronomical telescope this gives an additional 10 diopter uh, sorry this is a 10 times magnification i made a mistake there so uh, there are uh, many types of illuminations which are defined and there are at least six or seven types of illuminations in slit lamp uh, biomicroscopy so this is a typical classical one called diffuse illumination and where we can see the structures the lid structures the eyelashes the circumcorneal congestion or nevus or small elevated lesions on the conjunctiva the fictens foreign bodies you can get a broader and wider view it also allows evaluation of the tear film here the sidel test all these can be done by using the diffuse illumination and how is it done so this is the eye this is the illumination system we use a broad wide slit there and the light falls at an angle of around 30 to 40 uh, degrees from the center and illuminates almost the whole of the cornea or a little more than that and we this is how we view it so this is the viewing system this is they are separated by around 30 or 40 degrees angle this could be varied depending on how you want to see the structures they are not fixed uh, numbers you could vary you can explore to see the structures better so this is a very important i think even before going to small examinations like aqueous flare aqueous cells or a slit it is important to start with a diffuse illumination in fact it would be ideal to start with a torchlight illumination and then go to a uh, diffuse illumination from the slit lamp so there are at least seven methods which are described by Berli, Ber, berliner and that was the first one the second one is the diffuse or focal illumination so in this you use a slit which passes on to the structure of regard so this is what we want to see illuminate the structure and the focusing system comes here so this is what we see so there are different opticals uh, different ways of doing direct focal illumination and one of them is the optical section this is a classical example of this this can help us in identifying variations in the cornea as a slit you could see uh, the thickness of the cornea and try to compare it in different areas and you could also get a good section of the lens you could see the uh, different scattering that is happening in the nucleus uh in the stroma of the uh, uh, lens you could identify a lot of uh, lesions in this you could also look at the anterior one third of the vitreous through this slit wherein you could see some opacities or you know, tobacco dusting or all these structures can be seen with, seen with this this is called a direct focal illumination with an optical section so where we use a narrow slit a long slit elongated slit so this is we commonly go with this kind of illumination there's another kind of illumination which is also a direct focal but a roundish illumination or oval illumination is used wherein you get a good view of the anterior chamber where you can identify um, the aqueous cells and flare and you use the higher uh, illumination and a medium to high uh, illumination and magnification so you can see 
like this. So you'll just viewing from the straight ahead, but illumination is at an angle of 30 or 45 degrees. And the illumination is not a slit, but it is a roundish one. So you can see aqueous cells, flare, hyphema, and all that. The third type of direct focal illumination is a parallelopiped cornea, where you want to see a, a small area of the cornea and try to see the tear film, the anti uh, epithelium of the cornea, the stroma, and the endothelium. So in a focal uh, area, you want to see the details. You could use this kind of an illumination. So a little lesser illumination is suffice for this. And again, same illumination is at around 30 or 45 uh, degrees from the viewing system. So this is how you view that. The third one is the direct. So first one was um, uh, first one was diffuse illumination. Second was direct focal. This is the indirect illumination. Now, if you see in this picture, there's illumination falling on the iris actually, not on this part of the cornea. The illumination is on the uh, iris. We are seeing these blood vessels in the periphery with that as the background. So we are seeing a direct, uh, sorry, we are seeing an indirect illumination here. Uh, and we can see these structures better without, uh, without I mean, because of the background illumination that is there. So it's useful for corneal infiltrates, for uh, ghost vessels, or even active vessels, or microcysts, and other changes in the cornea. So very useful method of examination. So how do we do that? You uh, again, there's an angulation of 30 or 45 degrees. The angulate, the light is falling on. I have not shown the iris here, so you would you'll have to imagine the iris here. The light is falling on the iris and getting reflected back, and you are seeing the structures with the background illumination on the iris. So a very useful technique for illumination. Rather than direct, even indirect gives a lot of information regarding small lesions which may be missed in the direct illumination. This is called retroillumination, where the light falls on that structure, gets reflected back. Again, I'm missing the iris here. So a light that falls on the iris gets reflected back, and this offers the illumination for us. So uh, structures, uh, uh, defects in the iris, lens opacities and corneal lesions can be seen. The retroillumination can be from the surface of the iris or from the retinal surface. So what I have defined here, the iris defects or peripheral iridotomies or your pseudo exfoliation slit or the pigmentary glaucoma slits that are seen, all these can be better seen with retroillumination from the fundus. Whereas corneal lesions like microsis can be seen better with retroillumination from the iris. So that is called retroillumination. Once again, it's a very useful technique. Again, several types are defined, direct retroillumination as well as indirect retroillumination. So this is the way it happens. This is a very uh, different technique compared to the other techniques. This is called a specular uh, reflection, wherein the light that falls on the cornea and the viewing system are both angulated at around 60 degrees from each other. So none of them is directly in front of the cornea. Both are angulated around 30 degrees. So illumination is at 30 degrees. Viewing system is also at 30 degrees. So when you scan through the areas of the cornea at one point, you will suddenly see a bright image coming out and that from the endothelium or even the epithelium, endothelial cells, which is, responsible for the specular reflection. That is that is the angle at which the incident ray and the reflected ray become equal. And you see a nice glow from the endothelium. If you increase the magnification, you could even see, identify to a great extent the endothelial cell structure. Now, next one is the sclerotic scatter, where the light is not falling on the cornea directly, but it is falling at the limbus. So you can see in this diagram, the light falling at the limbus. When it falls at a particular angle, it undergoes total internal reflection as if it's a fiber optic uh, uh, tube. So light falls, it doesn't come out like this, doesn't go in, but it is getting uh, inter totally internally reflected and comes out from the other side. And so that is what you can see. Light is falling at the limbus here at one end, and the whole glow is seen at the periphery. A beautiful thing. And it's very useful to see, identify some of the signs of keratoconus um, also in this. So this is also 
called this is called a sclerotic scatter sorry this this is not for endothelial cells okay so this is what happens so slit lamp bio microscopy is very useful in anterior segment examination with different kinds of illumination different filters different tests can be done for the tear film or for the bleb or for the cornea uh, fluorescent staining sidereal test tear film everything can be evaluated very well with the anterior uh, with the uh, ocular surface examination and anti segment examination like the structures of the iris lens anterior vitreous aqueous everything can be very nicely examined by this so fundus examination is also possible using the 78 and 90d and this 78 and 90d lenses are kept as close to the eye as possible close as around 5 to 10 mm from the eye very close to the eye and it's held with the fingers the four finger and the thumb close to the eye and the slit lamp is moved front and back in order to get a good view of a, of the fundus here you uh, as you could you would recall we uh, when we spoke about indirect ophthalmoscopy we said that the the magnification offered by an indirect lens is calculated by 60 divided by the power of the lens so if it was 20d lens a 60d 60 divided by 20d would give rise to three times magnification so that's how we calculated the same applies here also so if a 90d lens is used the magnification that is offered is 90 by 60 that is uh, 90 by 60 is around 0.6 that means there is actually minification of the image there is no magnification then how do we see see the structures big with 90d it is mainly because of the uh, magnification offered by the slit lamp so with the slit lamp system you can get up to 10 times magnification of the fundus so with 78d it is a little more with 90d it is around 9 uh, 10 times magnification and that is how we see the fundus structures okay so you could also see the fundus structures with the central contact lens of the gonio lens the three mirror gonio lens as well as the two uh, lenses which are on these sides we'll come to that two mirrors which are on this side so 78d offers uh, advantage over direct ophthalmoscopy because it gives a stereoptic view of the uh, disc and macula so it's very very useful in identifying the depth of the cup elevated and depressed lesions in the retina 90d offers the advantage of a wider field of view at the cost of magnification magnification is much less with 90d but the field of view is more whereas with 78d uh magnification is more and the field of view is less sorry i was not able to put the animation and images over here because of lack of time so we also could do gonioscopy viewing of the angles and other diagnostic procedures quickly we go through gonioscopy very quickly and i want again the pan pgs on the panel to help me out with the answers because i am lost so there are four images over here you can see that this is an oct scan i have chosen for this there's a red light which is coming out of the angle of the anterior chamber it is coming back into the eye here in all the four all uh, the two images here and here it's going out of the eye in some other direction which of the above is the correct explanation for the principle related to gonioscopy is it a b c or d b b why b why not a mamma uh, the air the tear film corneal interface uh, acts as the site for total internal reflection of light yes. in the eye perfect perfect so if you were here i would have given you some chocolates but no i can't give you so that's the correct answer so the reflection that we are talking about the gonioscopy principle which we talk about is related to light rays passing through the cornea into the air so the density of the cornea is much high 1.33 compared to the density of refractive density whatever you call it Uh, of the air which is equal to 1 so when the difference is more the uh, critical angle is important and that's why this surface is more important and not this surface okay so what is happening here this is wrong because it's coming from the inner surface and what is happening here it is grazing parallel to the surface tangentially so that is not the answer the answer is this now which angle is the one which is called a critical angle once again any of you can help me 
C. Which is the critical angle? Very good. C is the critical angle. So this angle determines whether the structure will be seen or not. For example, if a light a ray of light coming from this structure, the edge of the pupil, is falling here, the angle is much less than the critical angle, and therefore the ray gets refracted out, and we are able to see. Whereas the light coming from this angle is more than the critical angle, and because it is more than the critical angle, it does not come out, but it gets reflected back into the eye. That's why we are not able to see this structure. So this is the critical angle we are talking about. Yes, you are right. One more chocolate for you. What is the critical angle for refraction at the cornea air interface? Is it 44, 45? Another five minutes, I'll finish. 44, 45, 46, 47. What is it? 46. Perfect. C. You know everything. Did you have all my slides before? <laughs> By any chance? Yes, 46. 46 degrees is the correct answer. Now, Trantas was the first one who visualized the angle structures. Which uh, ocular condition was he studying? Was it keratoglobus, keratoconus, angle recession, or bophthalmos? Anybody? Any clues? It was keratoglobus. So when he was seeing cases of keratoglobus, he saw that even without any uh, help, external aid, he was able to see the structures of the angle. So that is why he started understanding that there's something that is there in keratoglobus which allows us to see the angle structures, whereas in normal eyes, we are not able to see. So he started evaluating why we are not able to see and he came up with uh, something called a gonioscopic conditions, a gonioscopic uh, examination. So with what did he examine the keratoglobus cases? Was it a torchlight, contact lens, retinoscope or thalmoscope? Nobody likes history. I know that. So it was an ophthalmoscope. So he was using the ophthalmoscope to see and then he could see the uh, structures of the angle in a case of keratoglobus. So later he started indenting the in, uh, limbus to see better structures and he came up with this idea of gonioscopy. So which of the following? There are four diagrams here represents the principle of direct, of, direct of gonioscopy. A, B, C or D. Any of them, any of you? I know I have confused you because A, B, C are same images. <laughs> Did you want to say that? Yes, isn't it? So the principle of gonioscopy, I've, there are three different diagrams. Each one is showing the same thing. This was only to confuse you. This is the principle of indirect gonioscopy. So in direct gonioscopy, the the cornea air interface is removed completely and the light that comes out uh, comes out and you're able to see directly that is because the refractive index of this highly curved surface of the gonio lens and the cornea are almost identical so there's not much refractive index difference between the two and therefore only small refraction occurs here and not total internal reflection so the rays of light come out and we are able to see it from here Whereas in the gon indirect uh, gonioscopy, the ray of light hits the mirror and it's reflected mirror or prism. It hits there and comes out from the front. So in gonioscopy, you're seeing from one side, whereas in uh, the indirect gonioscopy, you're seeing from the front. This is used along with the slit lamp. This is not. Okay, so all these three are correct answers. So this is the Zeiss four mirror gonial lens. What is the angulation of the mirror? Yes, 64, 64, I heard you. Yes, you said that and I heard you. Very easy to remember. 46 is the critical angle. 64 is the angle in this. So most of the angulations of most of the lenses is around 62, 59 to 62 to 64 in that range. So four mirror has got 64. Others are uh, slightly different. So what are these used for gonio? Which of these is used for gonioscopy? Now you're seeing four structures and four images here. Is it A, is it B, is it C, or is it D? Which one? Which one is used for gonioscopy? Quick. C. C? C is the elongated one? No. It is the smaller one, the smallest one. This is the one which is used for 
gonioscopy. So do you know that each one is angulated differently here and each one has got a different angulation and they are like this. The gonio, this is the gonio one is 59 and the equatorial, uh, this is the uh, this is the equatorial which is 67 and this is 73. So this is more, uh, what do you say, more close to perpendicular because you have to see the periphery of the, uh, the retina. That's why it's more perpendicular. 59 to 62 is the gonio um, lens range, okay? And 67 is the equatorial. So you can remember one starts in 50s, one starts in 60s, one starts in 70s. So what does this diagram represent? So there are two positions. This is the angle. As you can see, the angle is very narrow. There's an iris, uh, the iris uh, lenticular contact almost. You're not able to see it with this position of the uh, gunio, but with this position, it is seen. That means not only the angulation of the mirror, but also its position in relation to the center. They also determine how, how well you see these structures. So if the mirror is closer to the center, you are able to see even these structures which are hidden. If you your mirror is here, you are not able to see them. So it represents that not just the angle, but the position of the mirror in relation to corneal apex also matters in visualizing. So you can do some manipulation when you are not able to see the angle structures. You could do some manipulation on the ocular surface, shift the uh, gonial lens to, to a little side, uh, to a little center, and then you will be able to see this. So I think this is one of the last slides. These are the differences between direct and gonial, direct and indirect gonial lenses. Direct mainly used in the OT, straight on view, uh, wide without uh, any slit lamp. That's what I mean. It gives a wider panoramic view and it has got a greater viewing angle because you see at one time along larger area, patient needs to be in a lying down position. Whereas indirect gonial lenses, it's very popular in the OPDs uh, mirror uh, images seen again a little confusing mirror images are seen so you need to know how to write the findings narrow limited view because at one point of time you are seeing one small segment or one or two clock as that's all limited viewing angle and patient can be seated so it's very comfortable to sit and do gonioscopy with the help of the slit lamp and some there's no coupling solution required most of the others require a coupling solution. So I think that's done with my presentation. So I couldn't even put a concluding slide today. There was no time. Sorry for Thank that. you so much, ma'am. I think Thank we you. covered uh, all the exam questions today. In fact, <laughs> each of them are a very big exam Hopefully. questions. Yeah. And you are preparing the students for the viva as well. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Uh, there are uh, uh, two questions on the slit lamp, ma'am. Yeah. And the first yeah. one is how is angle alpha created in the slit lamp? Is it okay. the same uh, what is present between the eyepieces? No. Angle alpha is something that is to do with the objective side of the uh, slit lamp. So uh, IPD is on the uh, side of the examiner, right? So if I'm seeing your eye, the IPD is on my side. So on your side is the angle alpha. It is mainly because the, uh, the eyepiece, the Mm, eyepiece uh, okay what do you call it i objective the objective which is located is wide enough and is at such a distance that when to when the beam of light that passes through the objective lens it offers that angle which is required for a good stereopsis so i have tried to explain i'm not sure whether it was clear uh, the next question is ma'am on the slit lamp examination we can huh. measure the size of the lesions with the help of a micrometer scale. Yes. So does it affect the size of the lesion or any epithelial defect when the patient moves back and forth? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It should matter. That's why for all these uh, positions, you need the head of the uh, slit lamp, the head of the patient to be tied around um, so that it is secured in one place. So it is very important. It does matter. It does matter. Okay. Uh, one question is on uh, gonioscope, ma'am. What is the shape of the peripheral lens in three-mirror gonioscope? And the peripheral lens is the oblong one, or the equator. The sorry, the rectangle one. The equator one is the oblong one, oval. 
large oval size. Okay. I think uh, these are the questions, ma'am. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, the participants, the students on the hot seat. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you much, ma'am. That was very wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. Thank you, iFocus. Thank you, Center for Sight, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Harika, and all the panelists who are there here. And I also thank want you. to thank Dr. Krishna Prasad for um, boosting my model when I felt, okay, I will be able to do it or not. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. It was wonderful. Uh, it was a nice series of three lectures, and it's all there on YouTube for anybody to watch anytime. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. And uh, I will announce the next lecture is by Professor Thomas Kuriakos of uh, Christian Medical College, Vailor. And he'll uh, go to history taking, actually. It's a wonderful wow. skill. It all begins with a good history is the topic, history taking skills in ophthalmology. He's a wonderful speaker and uh, we look forward to having you next Wednesday, July 8th at 8 o'clock. Good night. Thank you. Good night.